be reading this morning from Hebrews chapter 1. If you're um, following in the church Bibles, you can find that on page uh, 1201. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I've become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? The salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Rob. Morning again, everyone. Bibles open, please. That would be a great help to you. And um, I don't know if you uh, saw the story earlier on in the summer about the, the woman who had to be rescued seven miles, seven miles offshore on one of these things. Um, apparently, she had been out at sea for 21 hours, 21 hours, and had to be uh, sent off to hospital, suffering with a combination of sunstroke and hypothermia all at the same time, which is, uh, is kind of interesting, isn't it? And I think a quick internet search will tell you that she is not the first and she certainly won't be the last to get into trouble at the British seaside on one of these things. It wasn't that she deliberately kind of floated away. It wasn't that she planned to be out at sea for 21 hours. It was just that she was having a really nice time, bobbing around, enjoying the sunshine, she stopped concentrating on where she was, lost her bearings, and she drifted. And I wonder whether you noticed it, but 2 verse 1 takes that kind of picture and uses it to talk about the biggest danger that faces every single Christian believer in this room this morning. We must pay the most careful attention to what we've heard so that we do not drift. 
Christian person this morning, I wonder, do you think it's possible for you to ever drift away from Jesus? Because I would be failing you as your pastor if I did not make the assumption that you could and that you might well do that. Now, please don't mishear me. It's nothing personal. I'm not being rude. I just know that my own heart, and I know that drift has always been a big problem for the people of God. And I wouldn't be pastoring you properly if I did not have a healthy sense of realism about just how easy it would be for any one of us in this room this morning to just drift away. And it might just be that you feel that particularly uh, keenly at the moment. I think summer is always a time when we can uh, drift, being away from church for a period of time, perhaps without the, uh, the blessings of the normal routine that we can be in during term time. And how much more is that the case this summer, after six months of not being able to gather as church like we are able to a bit more this morning. Um, I don't think it would be a great surprise, actually, if lots of people didn't make it back on the transition back to church. Um, I do not think it would be a great surprise if there were quite a lot of people who were sat with us at the beginning of the year who we never see again. Because it is just frighteningly easy for the people of God to drift. And so it's into that context that this book of Hebrews is uh, written. It's actually one long sermon. Did you know that? Written, given to uh, people back in the first century who were uh, in danger of giving up meeting together and in danger of being dulled to God's word. And this letter, this sermon, is one long exhortation to say, don't do that. And the way the writer tries to um, anchor the people of God is by, on the one hand, giving them these big warnings, don't do it, don't do it. And then on the other hand, showing them how brilliant Jesus is so that they would never want to leave him behind. Warning, don't do it. Jesus is brilliant. Warning, Jesus is brilliant. Warning, Jesus is brilliant. And we will basically flip-flop between those two things all the way through to Christmas. And actually, if you have a look down at the passage this morning, you can see that same pattern. So chapter one, Jesus is brilliant. Start of chapter two, warning. Don't drift away from him. So we've just got one big thing we're going to say this morning. We've split it up into three parts. Uh, Page three of the service sheet might be helpful at this point. And part one, God has spoken. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. Uh, If you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, I wonder whether you've ever had the experience of looking up into space, God, are you there? Or maybe for you, God, do you care? Uh, God, if you're there, why don't you make yourself clearer? Because we live in a culture that says that God is silent, and we live in a culture that says that God is unknowable. Uh, Maybe he's not very good with people. Uh, Maybe he's just a really bad communicator. Maybe he's just trying to make it really, really difficult. But the claim of Hebrews is that God is a big talker. And the claim of Hebrews is that God has spoken, finally, definitively. Now, the way it happened in the Old Testament is uh, God kind of spoke in a a piecemeal way. Uh, Various ways, many times, is the way the author describes it. 
It was a bit like Israel had a kind of pen pal relationship with, uh, with God, a letter here, a text here, an email here, dreams, visions, prophecy. And it was a great blessing to have that kind of relationship with God. But in these last days that we live in, well, God has done something a whole lot better. And in these last days that we live in, God has given us the best possible revelation. Because in these last days, God has not just sent us a WhatsApp message, but he's come to live with us in the person of his son. Uh, imagine having a pen pal relationship with the queen. Imagine the, uh, the queen wrote to Joel Sibley down here in person every week. That would be a great privilege for Joel. But imagine if the queen actually came and knocked at his door. I want to come and live with you personally. I want to get to know you on that kind of intimate basis. Can you see how that puts the relationship on a different level? Can you see that that's a different thing entirely? In the past, God spoke many ways, various times. Piecemeal, pen pal. In these last days, he has spoken by his son. And so part two, therefore, it should just be really obvious that once God has spoken in Jesus, there's nothing more to be said because you cannot get more than Jesus. You cannot get to know God any better than him knocking on your door. Can I come and live with you for three years? And do you notice even the structure of the verses kind of uh, highlight the point? Just have a look, would you, at the table I've put on your service sheets? In the past, God spoke many times various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, full stop. Many times, various ways versus one way. God spoke, present tense, God has now spoken, final, definitive. After Jesus, nothing more to be said. You cannot get more than Jesus. And can you see how Hebrews really drives that point home in all sorts of different ways? Okay, so end of verse three, if I go and sit down, what do you think? You think, fantastic, we're finished. We're gonna get out of here early. He's done, he's completed. And so when Jesus sits down, verse three, it means that the work of salvation has been finished, price paid, salvation done. And so the words, the words of salvation that God thinks we need to know have been said. All you need for knowing God and living with him forever. And then just to drive it home even further, we get this contrast between Jesus and the angels. And the point is that in the Bible, if an angel speaks, that's quite exciting. Angels were a massive part of the way that God spoke to his people. If an angel speaks, you listen. You know, just think about Christmas, if you want an example of that. And that was particularly the case for the first readers, because 2 verse 2 of the way that angels were so key as messengers of the old covenant that was given to Moses at Mount Sinai, which just by the by, and we'll come to it more as we go through the series, seems to be the big thing that the people back then were tempted to drift off towards. But again, the thing is the comparison, because verse five, to which of the angels did God ever say, you're my son? How would you feel if an angel pitched up this morning to speak to us? Would that be a whizzy? Would that be exciting? Would that connect you to God in a deeper way? And, you know, by all means, get the phone out and, um, you know, take a selfie and put it on Facebook. But please do not think that that is more exciting than having Jesus come to live with you 
for three years. Because nothing comes close to God's angel trumping son. Now, lots of people don't like this idea, and they want to talk about um, how God speaks to us in other ways, and we should look for new revelation from God. And please don't mishear me. I am not saying that God couldn't go back to the many times and in various ways thing. Uh, God could go back to the kind of pen pal piecemeal uh, system all over again. We're just saying that we have something so much better than that. And we're just saying that 2 verse 1, the New Testament never calls us to look for new revelation, but always calls us to pay more careful attention to what we have already heard. Jesus, final, superior, sufficient. There was um, a student in my old church um, in Cambridge who, um, who is now a missionary in one of these very closed Muslim countries in the, in the Middle East where they don't have access to, um, to the Bible. And my friend um, tells me that again and again the people he meets over there, who, who would call themselves Christians now, uh, didn't encounter God through the Bible because they didn't have one but again and again encountered God through dreams and visions. But the thing that he tells me is that in every single circumstance, the vision they have is of Jesus because of Hebrews 1, because he is God's final word. And so wouldn't it be madness for us to envy them and think, oh, I wish that God spoke to me in that kind of way? When they've got the same thing, in fact, all they've got is a hazy vision, and we've got God's word about his one revelation, Jesus. Uh, can I just say that as a church leader, I think about this a lot, because I don't want you to miss out on anything. Uh, there would be lots of the parts of, church, of the church today who would look at what we do at St. Thomas's and say that we are wrong to put so much emphasis on Jesus as the final word from God. Uh, they'd look at what we do and say it's pretty restricted, uh, pretty limited, it's not very whizzy, it's not where the action is. But all I'm trying to argue is that you cannot get more than Jesus. Nothing in all creation comes close to God's angel trumping son. Final, sufficient, superior. And so part three, uh, the logic, and the logic is quite relentless here, isn't it? God has spoken, final, sufficient words. So what would you expect the application to be well, we therefore, we must pay the most careful attention, lest we drift. Uh, imagine if I told you that the Queen was coming next Sunday. She's going to come and speak to us. She's got a personal message for all of you. I bet you'd come. I bet nothing would keep you away. Yeah, not even the sort of 10K fun run or uh, getting lunch ready for the family or the B&Q uh, trip. And so if Hebrews 1 means anything at all, well then we'll be here to listen to God's angel trumping, dare I say, queen trumping son, even when things get busy. Because not even the words of the queen are in the same league as the words of Jesus. Uh, David Attenborough, he seems to be the kind of go-to person at the moment, doesn't he, on matters of kind of uh, nature. But what about verse 3, the one who made everything, who was there at the beginning, and the one, verse 12, who will uh, kind of roll up the heavens. Do you like this imagery in verse 12, the one who will roll up the heavens a bit like I might sort of roll up my picnic blanket? That's not being rude to David Attenborough. He's an important person with helpful things to say, but his words are not in the same league as Jesus. Uh, at the moment, I think it's David Starkey, Kate Williams seem to be the kind of go-to people on the BBC, matters of history. But what about the one who, verse 2, was there at the beginning? And the one, verse 12, whose years 
will not end. That's not being rude to Kate Williams or Dan Snow, David Starkey. They're important people with helpful things to say. They're just not in the same league as God's angel trumping son. Um, I know the joke about sort of falling asleep in a sermon. I, I know it's a big thing in their church circles and uh, don't worry, I get that and all the rest of it. But at the same time, I think it is one of the things that saddens me most as a church leader when you see people switched off and not concentrating. Which is not to say that I like the sound of my own voice and I think that you should do too. But simply that the writer of Hebrews would call that reckless behaviour in the extreme. And we should do whatever it takes that we can pay the most careful attention. Now, there might be medical reasons to nod off and the rest of it. But I think actually in most cases what the writer of Hebrews would recommend is an earlier night. We must pay the most careful attention. Uh, I guess now would be a great moment to talk about those home groups that David mentioned, uh, Friday uh, Bible study groups. If you're not currently in a Bible study group, well, with Hebrews 1 on the table, now might be a great moment to think about joining. Drop me a line, I can make that happen. And if you are already in a group, please don't stop coming just because things get busy. God has done all the hard work. He's done all the talking. All he asks is that we pitch up and we pay the most careful attention. Isn't this a great place to be? Beginning of a new year as a church? Listening, listening, listening. Paying attention to the words of Jesus. And telling others what we've heard from him. And we could go on, couldn't we? We could talk about personal Bible reading. We could talk about what Helen was going on about at the prayer meeting on Wednesday, family times together. However obsessed we are with Jesus, the writer says, be more obsessed. However much we're currently listening to Jesus, the author says, listen more carefully. Because the implication, if we don't do that, is that we will be like the boat who slips the moorings and we'll be like the woman who ends up seven miles offshore. God has spoken a final, sufficient, superior word. So let's be a church that pays the most careful attention, lest we drift away from him.